Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 383rd New Social Environment. I am Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Andiarika Chuke, Gabriel Florens, and Leanne Norman. We are thrilled to have the poet I.S. Jones here, who has a special ephrastic treat for us today and will read to close our program. Just a few quick notes before we get started. The Rail team will be helping out with tech. If you have questions, uh, closed captions are available by pressing the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we have started all of our events here at the Rail with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom and recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation as spoken by the great Angela Davis. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that I will post in just a moment. Uh, but first, uh, I'd like to introduce today's guest and host. Uh, first, we have artist and archivist, Anyarika Chuke. He lives and works in New York. His largest body of work is titled The Forever Museum Archive, which uh, is from 2011 to the present. Uh, which is a disquieting collection of sculptures, texts, and images in which Chuke analyzes social, cultural, and political structures. Co-commissioned by LMCC and Pioneer Works, the Forever Museum Archive circa 6000 BCE is on view through October 31st, 2021. Uh, and we will be posting more details to that in the chat momentarily. Uh, our, our other guest today, uh, Gabriel Florens, who in 2012, helped found Pioneer Works and led its development into a nonprofit and the formation of its various departments. Florence is currently the founding artistic director and lead curator uh, over at Pioneer Works. Our host today is writer and strategist Leanne Norman, who has written for BOM Studio, the Studio Museum of Harlem's magazine, and the Penn GSC Journal on Urban Education, as well as regularly here at the Brooklyn Rail. Leanne studied art criticism and writing at the School of Visual Arts, and she is currently based in New York City. Uh, we are going to start today's conversation with a screening. So I will bring that up now and then we'll go over to Leanne. So here we go. The job ahead of us is very clear. Nancy's personal crusade, like that of so many other wonderful individuals, should become our national crusade. It must include a combination of government and private efforts which complement one another. I will announce tomorrow a series of new proposals for a drug-free America. Taken as a whole, these proposals will toughen our laws against drug criminals, encourage more research and treatment, and ensure that illegal drugs will not be tolerated in our schools or in our workplaces. Listen to this news account from a hospital in Florida of a child born to a mother with a cocaine habit. Nearby, a baby named Paul lies motionless in an incubator, feeding tubes riddling his tiny body. He needs a respirator to breathe and a daily spinal tap to relieve fluid buildup on his brain. Only one month old, he's already suffered two strokes. Our job is never easy because drug criminals are ingenious. They work every day to plot a new and better way to steal our children's lives, just as they've done by developing this new drug crack. For every door that we close, they open a new door to death. They prosper on our unwillingness to act. So we must be smarter and stronger and tougher than they are. It's up to us to change attitudes and just simply dry up their markets. I recently read one teenager's story. She's now de determined to stay clean, but was once strung out on several drugs. What she remembered most clearly about her recovery was that during the time she was on drugs, everything appeared to her in shades of black and gray. And after her treatment, 
she was able to see colors again. So to my young friends out there, life can be great, but not when you can't see it. So open your eyes to life, to see it in the vivid colors that God gave us as a precious gift to his children, to enjoy life to the fullest. Together with our ongoing efforts, these proposals will bring the federal commitment to fighting drugs to $3 billion. Let us not forget that in America, people solve problems, and that's where you come in. Each of us has to put our principles and consciences on the line, whether in social settings or in the workplace, to set forth solid standards and stick to them. There's no moral middle ground. Indifference is not an option. We want you to help us create an outspoken intolerance for drug use. For the sake of our children, I implore each of you to be unyielding and inflexible in your opposition to drugs. My generation will remember how America swung into action when we were attacked in World War II. The war was not just fought by the fellows flying the planes or driving the tanks. It was fought at home by a mobilized nation, men and women alike building planes and ships, clothing sailors and soldiers, feeding Marines and airmen. And it was fought by children planting victory gardens and collecting cans. Well, now we're in another war for our freedom, and it's time for all of us to pull together again from the pulpits of this spirit-filled land we would welcome your reassuring message of redemption and forgiveness and of helping one another. And this camera in front of us, it's a reminder that in Nancy's and my former profession and in the newsrooms and production rooms of our media centers, you have a special opportunity with your enormous influence to send alarm signals across the nation. Thank you so much, Nick. And thank you again to Anetica and Gabriel for joining us today. Um, wow, really powerful video. Um, I, was, I, I was really excited to be in conversation with you both because I tend to think that um, artists kind of have a set of concerns that they sort of continue to revisit and kind of work around throughout their careers. And I think, you know, some of them are able to you know, really kind of focus in on one form to manifest those ideas or concepts. And then there are others like Onyedika, who, you know, I think maybe you sort of let uh, the idea that you're working with or the thing that you're trying to work through kind of guide the form that um, it manifests in. And so, you know, I kind of like the um, sort of messy or, you know, complex and layered juxtapositions and, you know, those kinds of connections. And I think we can see in the video as well that there was just a lot of kind of, um, reflecting back and forth of, you know, history and present and things like that. And um, the work in the exhibition, uh, the Forever Museum Archive um, that you have on view currently right now, you've been working on this for a while and its latest iteration at the governor's island space, I think um, would be a really great place for us to start sort of learning about your practice. And then maybe we can kind of go back and sort of unpack that a little bit. So um, can you, I, I see you're in the, the space right now, actually, um, if you'd like, could you just sort of tell us about the Forever Museum Archive and um, its latest iteration? Yes, well, um, well, thanks a lot for everyone for joining us for this program. I'm so happy to be able to share the work. It's been a long time in the making, especially this um, iteration, which we started in 2019, you know, without seeing what the world is going to become with COVID and without seeing just the, the total intensity, the protests, but for the most part, I began to work in 2011, you know, in Libya, you know, right before the Gaddafi, you know, uh, administration took out of power. So I was there namely in January, so looking at building sites. So these projects, I consider them to be like site museums, you know, site museum meaning a museum that's very much in, you know, in proximity to, esca to, to, uh, to the um, excavation um, space. So in this case, you know, we are located on Governor's Island, you know, adjacent to it is, is um, is Wall Street, you know, somewhere in the proximity in the East River is Rikers Island. So you have the islands of New York, and you have this kind of connection, this interwovenness of like power structures and mythologies. You know, so this work had to sort of like take this shape, you know, in order for us to deal with the cost of project that's been part of, you know, much of, you know, the Western Empire. You know, every, every, you know everyone has it for the most part, but the very particular type that I've noticed in, in the United States. And the video that we just watched is called Free Actors. 
you know, I think we should, we should probably talk about that work a little bit more. It's the first video that I've made in like about a decade. And uh, the main image that you see there with the Reagan, so it's Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan, you know, are the first two actors. You know, they, bo they both met and eventually got married, you know, you know, while acting, you know, they're dramatists, you know, they now study sociology, they're not some sort of, um, you know, specialist, you know, on the war on drugs or anything dealing with, you know, what, you know, you know human psychology, you know, they are people that have, have power. But in 1986, they were able to make this film, this video, you know, this kind of infomercial, you know, gathering people's energy towards fighting, you know, mainly black and brown people, you know, like in this supposed war on drugs, which in many parts was started in 1971 by, you know, Richard Nixon. But um, anyhow, the way the project works, I'm continuously research. I conduct research, you know, most of the, most of the year, and I mean, produce a project out of three months, you know, out of 12 months of the year, which is how this project was made. You know, um, I'm not sure that's answering the question, you know, but the works are usually nomadic in a sense, you know, they are usually taking the shape of, of the, the location. You know, I believe in this idea of like vernacular architecture, I believe in, you know, mining systems to find ways to you not know, communicate about the parts, you know, like the footprints apart. And it's a practice that does not necessarily want to adhere to, you know, sculpture, you know, or photography or painting, you know, it's a bit of all of it in many ways. And um, if there's any, you know, if you would like to interject, ask a question, just feel free. Otherwise, I'll just keep ranting, you know, it would not be as productive. Um, no, that's great. I wonder, um, you know, you said a lot there in terms of, um, you know, the site and the location of where the current exhibition is. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about some of the themes that um, you've been exploring for your work? Yeah, so in this particular, this iteration of the work, um, we sort of focus on the cost of real project, the history of incarceration and the mythology of power. And I think in my work, I've been asked, there's a lot of questions I've been asked over the last 10 years about the archive, you know, mainly people ask me what about the Roman, you know, iconography, you know, they're like, well, you're Nigerian, what are you doing dealing with Rome? And so it's, it's an odd question, right? It's, I think, you know, my answer normally to that is, you know, people are transient, you know, history been given to us, you know, based on the victor. And much of Nigeria was colonized, you know, either from the, you know, Islamic fact, you know, factions or it's coming from the Roman you know, sort of European, you know, if you look at the United States, most of the judiciary system, you know, from the way policing or like the Republic is all Roman. So in this particular project, I wanted to really delve into that mythology, you know, to talk about power. So in the screen here, you have this idea of like narcissists, right, that pool that's on the floor, which is basically, it's a replica of a narcotics bag, you know, with water, and the water circulates throughout the whole entire exhibition. You know, then to your left, you have another set of mytholo mythologies with these three actors, right? You have the Reagans and you have Ed Norton in the second film called American History X. So in that screening, you know, you saw when the main character, you know, Ed, he sort of walks up and then he's stomping into the ground, into the sidewalk. You know, the original film, which was made in 1998, he's stepping on somebody's head to kill them. You know, his jaw being lodged onto the sidewalk and the brain basically, I guess in that case, would be crushed. You know, so that piece is called um, um, curb stomp. So I wanted to get into, you know, one is like to strip back, you know, to, to get rid of the person that was being murdered. You know, so I went into the film and erased away the victims. You know, so the first thing that he does is actually to shoot somebody, you know, and kill that individual, and then shoot the other victim, and then step on his head, right? So I just, I edited all of that out. And also in the film, you notice that when you saw Ed, his skin was blown a little bit because all the tattoos that he had on him was also erased. So he carried, you know, a swatch stick up on, you know, on, um, on his chest and a lot of white supremacist tattoos on his chest. And in doing that, yeah, right there. So in erasing away all of this stuff from clip, uh, clip by clip, was to, or frame by frame rather, was to not allow people to escape, you know, blame, you know, to just look at the body, to look at the psychology, to not say, well, I'm not a neo-Nazi, so therefore I cannot carry that ideology, 
you know, but many, many times we do look at white supremacy as either those that are complacent that allows things to go through, or those that are actors, you know, within that model, you know, that allows it to sort of rise with more power. And the work behind me, the um, Feet of Hermes, you know, this is the second version of it. So the first version being shown at Socrates Sculpture Park. Uh, this particular version is called Circa 2020, you know, and um, so in this one, you have like an oil painting on the surface of the sculpture and surrounding the work are these bones, you know, and all of these works were modeled by myself, you know, in clay first, and then, you know, molds were made in the casting process, and of course the finishing process of the oil paint. And so what you're looking at is a pool of water, you know, that the color blue is derived from Rikers Island and the corrections off the um, Department of Correction, blue, the certain tint of blue that comes from that, from the, um, from the, from the logo. And also the bubbles that you'll see inside of it is being caused by soap from Corecraft, produced by Corecraft Industries, you know, which is, you know, in fact, the same um, space that that um, Governor Cuomo, you know, acts to produce the um, hand sanitizers for, you know, for like for like cleanliness, right? But this is for all these products were produced in New York State prison, New York State jails. And hand sanitizer is meant to keep people clean for the most part was something that was being produced elsewhere by individuals deemed to be invisible. You know, so that that kind of you know, irony was something I've always sort of explored in the work, the use of the soap, which entered my practice in, I believe it was like 20, 2018, 2019. And eventually as I did some work on Rikers Island, it became more of a thing that I used in, in the work. And here you're seeing it inside of this pool. But that marbling is all you know, so for the most part. Great, thank you. Um, I really find it interesting, you know, that you're when you're talking about like in the film, you know, erasing sort of these symbols and you know allowing us to really focus on how we ourselves perhaps are also like implicated, um, you know, thinking about the soap or the hand sanitizer. Um, that we use and consume, but yet, you know, it's it's made through um, exploitive labor, those kinds of things. Um, can you also talk a little bit about the material connections that are in this work? You know, you did mention um, the soap, but you're, I think also, you know, some of the materials that you made um, some of the other sculptures out of, like their historical connections, you know, personal connections through different iterations of the work as well. Yes, so the way the archive works, the, you know, this is sort of a glossary. You know, of like checkpoints. You know, so each time so I've, I've built this stuff, you know, from um, my thesis work at Cooper Union in 2011, and I just returned from Libya to Switzerland in 2012, to American Academy of Rome in 2015, and a few other places in between and after that. So there, there is a glossary system, you know, where certain things will repeat themselves. And when I model the sculptures, all of the sculptures are made from the same clay. So I use the oil based clay. You know, so in some cases, I might have made a replica of 1847, you know, when I was at the American Academy of Rome, dealing with all the weapons that were being made for, you know, the Afghan crises that were then left in Afghanistan. And eventually that AK-47 entered, or that model, right, that template, then entered much of the rest of the world's, you know, insurgency um, actions. So now imagine, that that clay is the same clay that's used to produce the feet of Hermes or used to produce the bones or used to produce, you know, the severed head of Hercules, you know, she's also part of this project. So there is that material connection within the archive, where physically the things are not just being made by myself in the studio, I still believe in the process of making, you know, not outsourcing the works, you know, per se, but the actual material in itself is something that's, that connects the whole archive, you know, without just being something, um, that's more intellectual, like theory around it. And just to speak about this image that's on the screen now. So there's a severed head of Hercules and I modeled it after a Roman copy that's at the Metropolitan Museum. And so this work I began in 2019, you know, I believe it was in December when Trump lost the, the hearings and he was supposed to be taken out of office, which never happened. But as 2018 hit, you know, we also had this whole protest so that bluish green color that you see the sculpture casted in, you know, is glass, you know, that I collected in Soho, you know, after the, uh, after the, the lootings, you know, started as a protest. And of course, it got, you know, things happened and it became a little more of an adventure. 
you know, per se. So I collected the glass and I cast it with the head, you know, made the face and the teeth out of this material. And it's a way to, to preserve the material. But at the time, it was just a lot of um, calling services just getting rid of this archival, you know, uh, substance. You know, so casting it into the object is a way to protect it, is a way to allow for a mythology, a mythological figure, you know, to be somewhat engulfed by the people. You know, Hercules is just one of those figures, you know, even as someone that grew up, you know, namely like communities of color, you know, you'd sort of hear about this hero, you know, this white male hero. And, um, you know, and it, it was a project I did in 20, the 2015 project at the American, American Academy of Rome focused on the year of 1919, which was around the same time that Mussolini had control of Libya. You know, also the same amount at the same time where he's having himself made in the likeness of Hercules. You know, so you can imagine Mussolini and in some cases Hitler and a few other autocratic, you know, white male figures having themselves made into this heroic, you know, mythological being. So to sever the head with some was an edit that felt out necessary, you know, in mythology. And to cast it in that material was also something that felt necessary as a way to preserve. But um, so the work shifted, you know, changed from the time that you know Gabriel and I at MCC and Pioneer Works, you know, started to conceive this project to the presentation of it, you know, in this particular exhibition. Um, I think that's a great way to bring Gabriel into the conversation, actually. Um, can you talk a little bit about? You know how you in first encountered Juanita's work, and what draws it to uh, what draws you to it curatorially. Really interested to know about that. Um, thank you. Um, I met when did I meet you? So I met you at Queens Museum in 2015, I think. That was when you were doing the studio uh, program there, and it was like it, it was immediate. You know the type of thing of like I'm in, like I'm interested in you just as far as like how. It was a conversation first, and then I saw the work afterward. And I think that, you know, Onyedika's practice is so, there's nothing straightforward about it. And that's something that for me, I really look for in terms of, I like to think I understand something and then realize I do not understand it. And for me, he always tells me stories that end up kind of, it's like when you're reading an amazing book and it kind of colors your whole frame around you like whenever I have a conversation with Erdogan from the very first one at Queens Museum it was like I never thought about that link at all and also I thought this work was about something that was straightforward and it's completely not straightforward and you started looking at all of his projects and they're like these 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 threads that connect all of these really kind of disparate things and they end up being I think it's like this un, this kind of intangible thing with artists that their work is so varied but there's such a clear thread and so I feel like Onyedika has these crazy projects that I kind of wouldn't make sense of. And then once you start speaking of them, you see these kind of linked worlds and you see there's a very clear thread and style. And for me, I was just always very intrigued by. And, you know, at Pioneer Works, we have different aspects of how we work with people, which is what's so beautiful about kind of long form relationships. And really, you know, I don't like to get into a project that doesn't make sense for that artist, for where they're at, for what they want to do. And so the first thing you know he did was he applied for our residency, got into our residency program, and we I remember we tried to do a small show actually on the second floor and it was like the budget wasn't big enough and this and that and like he's a he's an ambitious man and you know we wanted to do something at a certain level and we we kind of were gonna do it and it was like you know what this is not right and we both just kind of agreed like we can't do what you need to do and it's like you know we, we became friends as well and I just really wanted to see the work done at a certain scale. I wanted to tell a really like larger st story than I'd seen, because I'd seen from the Socrates Sculpture Park thing, from the Queens Museum, these, these threads. And so I really wanted to do a large scale show for years. And it was like, the timing wasn't really happening yet. And then um, for the circumstances and Governor's Island approached us to, to do uh, LMCC, to do a, an exhibition with somebody to propose something. And they said that there, there was a theme and I'm not really like a theme type of curator usually. And they said water. And I was like, water? And I, he'd, been, he'd been telling me this story about uh, core craft, basically, which just the idea of like prisoners being paid 60 cents an hour to make, you know, cleaning materials that are cleaning society. And with this like completely exploitative system of labor, like I literally 
I thought about that for like a year. He just, he had these sculpt, these, this sculpture that was this, the serpent's head that was connected with these tubes. And I thought about sculpturally just as, that's what I like about it too. It's like, he's just a very skilled sculptor. It's a very, it's, it's a sculpture at face value. It has just a certain quality. But then you're like, oh, this is connected with the soap and the soap is made by these inmates. And he talked a lot about his, um, his experience at Rikers Island, which I'd love for you to talk about a bit on Nitika. And I just had it in my head all the time. Right when they said water, I was like, this is it. This is the project to do. And we thought about, he talked to me about the, the Hercules sculpture, about this idea of connecting these sculptures with this kind of like vascular system. So I was like, right when they said water, I was like, core crafts on Yerika. And I was so excited. I didn't say anything to them. Um, and then I was like, oh, I, made, I, made, I called him right away. I was like, all right, I have to propose a few things. I don't know if they're gonna take it, but what do you think about this thing? Like, I think this is the time for us to work together. Um, so, you know, it, it, uh, we proposed it. We proposed a few projects to them. And, but I knew this was gonna, I was like, this, this is, you know, when you just know an idea is like, this is good, this is the time. And it feels, it feels like we will, a good thing about, you know, my relationship with Anyetica, but also Pioneer Works and, and um, what we can do with people is I know this is like a piece of another project that'll happen down the line or another, like we want to keep doing things. So I feel like just like, this is not not a this is not a, an exhibition that's a final of something. It's like, we're already talking about how could this travel and how could this mutate? So I feel like there's a lot there for, for, for us, but this was really, I think the first time that I felt like this, that he's connecting different kind of mythologies that he's creating that, that is told in a little bit of a larger way than I've seen. So I was really just proud. And, um, you know, we've, we've gotten close over the years, so I'll, I'll stop there, but I don't know if you want to say anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, no, it's, it's been, definitely been a journey. And um, yes, yeah, so I'm not sure we can on Nick, if we like jump to the video work, no, not the video work, but to the, the Renaissance painting. So like in connecting the threads, you know, so much of the work, you know, when I present objects, you know, like in this kind of large scale museum format, it tends to be an archival piece. You know, so when I worked at the American Academy of Rome, I placed uh, like a late Roman object in fourth century BCE within my particular, you know, installation. And this particular work that we have here, you know, I replaced that archival piece with an actual Renaissance painting, you know, dated, you know, from, you know in the 1600s as a way to talk about the power structure, you know, and also this, this, the painting is then turned to a side, right, to kind of shift the hierarchy, also to challenge the viewing of, of, of the audience. It's a way to just uh, create a riff. But in many ways, so this, this then connects back to a, a project I was working on called the, on the Parents of Christ EP, you know, dealing with the mythologies of bodies before Christianity. And also connecting the slave trade and with the Renaissance, you know, talking about where the money came from, where this sort of idea of like, you know, of like beauty, right? You sort of had to have a continent or maybe the west part of a continent that was sort of you know, decimated to create wealth, to have a golden age. You know, in Italy, you know, so if you look at the Dutch and the making of the stock market, you also had slavery and the making of ships to create the golden age of the Dutch. So that's the connection. And then here within the exhibition, if you get a chance to visit, there's, a, there's a, a cut glass piece that we have, you know, mounted, you know, within the exhibition that overlooks Wall Street, then connecting, you know, our current, you know, system of, of transactions, you know, with the greater labor system. So all these pieces from like Paul Craft, you know, the Paul Craft material to the Renaissance painting as an actual artifact, you know, is as connected to, you know, the soap and also connected to the locality. So the structure that we're in now, this LMCC building was a munitions, you know, weapons, I mean, you know, bullets were made here, cannons were made here, right? So even thinking about what does that mean, you know, the greater commercial aspect, you know, by war making. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a ton of connections. And I wonder if I could do a quick like slideshow, if I can get control of this. I, I wanted, I wanted yeah. to interject one time about like, I don't know if you want me to tell the story, but oh, so, so we, we, we wanted to, uh, we were showing this painting, right? But, but the painting was like a whole mess getting the paint. It was the whole thing. It was at Sotheby's and we had to figure out how to get it. But then we realized that we measured, basically LMCC had put in the vent that we didn't know about when we did the show. Cause this show was picked before COVID. And then it was like a year and a half and we all know what happened. But it was like this, this thing, when we went back we realized that there was this vent all of a sudden. So we couldn't hang the painting 
straightforward because the, the plan was always he was going to subvert the painting with a different way and and so the subversion was in, inherent but we got there and we realized that the painting could not be shown so we couldn't put it on the wall so all of a sudden we had to figure out what do you do with the painting and i think why i wanted to tell that is that we realized all of a sudden well, we could show it sideways and it's like the way you dealt with it nonetheless is very nimble he doesn't like a lot of artists they'd be like freaking out like it's not going to be perfect and there was this one vision but the vision is so complex and it can kind of distort to um, where it needs to be, but it's, he's so specific in terms of the, what lo the location of Governor's Island and the research that he did on like, what is the history of this location? But there was this kind of happy accident where all of a sudden he flipped the painting. It was like this perfect, very simple subversion that happened. Um, but yeah, I just want to say that because it was like this really funny moment of this, this exhibition has been like three years of just like changes and like COVID and, you know, just all of this madness that he's been through. You know what's so funny? The events were always there. We just forgot. <laughs> I remember one that came in, I was like, oh shit, like, where did the events come from? And then LMCC staff are always, always here. Like, y'all just forgot about it. And so that's also that part of memory, you know, history making. You know, it's, it's, it is a nimble project. And I love the fact that historians would eventually have to reattribute artifacts, right? Everything is just very malleable. It only sucks when we just start to pretend that there's a set structure, right? And we want people to adhere to that. We, we stop listening and we stop acting with, with emotion. You know, so that's, yeah, so I think that that's a part of it, right? Being able to move around and shift. But ultimately, I think if, if the soul of the project is together, everything will work out. And if you have a team of people that, you know, that wants to work with it. And this is not an easy thing to curate. You know, the space is nearly 3,000 square feet. There's so many different components. Um, I just wish people can, you know, come here in person at some point and just be able to work a little bit. But so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna kind of run through a few images, you know, hopefully that's all right. You know, since we are talking about works that have so much process, and I believe that we have a lot of you know, artists, you know, probably in the audience. And I think something that we love talking about is process, but I'll try to keep it like super like brief and try to make connections between past projects and current projects. And if I'm talking too much, please interject, you know, and I will slow down or just shut up. But so do I have screen share options? Yes, I do. So I'll take you through my crazy little, um, get rid of this. So this is my Google Drive. I just got this together just to walk people through the process a little bit. So this work here is a work that I did when I mentioned Cooper Union. This is my this is my thesis work, you know, at school, you know, like coming straight back from Libya. And you can see the components that are within this particular project. So we have the columns, right? So this part here is where you see the pool, you know, with this column kind of sticking through it. But what you're looking at here is all plaster. This is about working with a lot of plaster. And this large image in the center is this big silver gelatin print. You know, so it's a black and white, you know, it's a black and white image shot with a four by five camera in Libya, you know, in situ of the Museum of Sabrata, which we built by Benito Mussolini. So that way of looking at history and fascism was always something that I was very much interested in. Looking at monuments, something I started looking at, namely in 09. And then, but definitely by 2011, I was heavy trying to analyze that stuff. And this work was made in Switzerland in 2012. It was my first project outside of school. You know, and then this particular component with the wood, you know, it's now becomes a wooden benches within the current iteration of the project and the stained glass work, the cut glass work of Plexi that's in this particular project that we have here. You know, you, you, know, you see in the, in the dome, you know, also made with the same colors. Um, so we just kind of scroll through. So that's, there's that component there with the wood. There. So there's a lot of looking inside and outside. So this is a work that I had at Queens Museum. I'm not sure if Gabriel saw this work, you know, when he visited the studio, but it's a column, you know, made from, you know, plaster and it's a way of like measuring spaces with this kind of golden X torso, the golden ratio which is a colonial uh, mechanism. But I, I was very much interested in like seeing that move physical and dealing with it in a very tactile way that was also falling apart. 
And these works, this is all archival material. So this, so the log that I carved to make these sculptures was dated to the, to the year of 17, 1775. You know, so it's our actual, this was the second oldest tree in, um, in New York, it came from Pelham Bay Park. So carving that to then commemorate this kind of death, you know, of like systems, you know, different insurgencies that happened since then, and like protests, you know, that, you know, the, the one that happened with the Shades Rebellion around the same time that the tree started growing. But uh, so let me just kind of zoom out after this image. So this is the work that I mentioned, you know, where I took a Roman object from fourth century BCE and I put it directly into the archive, you know, by casting it in this kind of white concrete, you know, in a project that related to Mussolini and his, you know, takeover of Libya. And the making of walls, you know, what is fascism, what is this idea that everything needs to sort of move a certain way that was never, there was something very skewed about it. So I just took this, you know, slab of steel. And so this related to a museum in Tripoli, you know, with this palm, this like potted palm on the other side of the wall, you know, of, um, of this one room that dealt with, with artifacts. But thinking about the difference between a garden and a forest, you know, of like something that's grown within a, a real space and artificial space, you know, something very digital about the pattern of a palm. And this is the first version of the Hermes uh, fountain that I made at Socrates Sculpture Park with a steel, with a steel base that was, then, that was then allowed to rust to create this red, deep red color. So the, the, the version we have at LMCC is a blue version. You know, this is the red version. So I'm in the midst of thinking about a yellow version. So these are all, you know, colors that are coming from early childhood education. Myself having it working in schools, you know, working from pre-K -K up until college. Thinking about like pedagogy, you know, often. So this is when I was at um, Pioneer Works, you know, making this work and Dustin Yellen actually took this picture. So as mentioned, that, that sculpture was modeled in clay. And over the over time, the clay would just sort of change color as I'll add more clay to it to do bigger projects. And this is when the labyrinth first started. So this was in Skowhegan 2017 when I started thinking about the, the labyrinth. But by the time I started making larger versions of it, I was in France, you know, considering you know, just the whole bureaucratic system, which is in many ways people believe came from, you know, that other part of the Roman Empire, which is the French Alps. So this is a drawing of it on the floor. This is back in 2017. So this sort of wood and using bamboo to draw the labyrinth on the ground in 2017 then became the church pews, the Quaker church pews that there are in the current project. And the bones. This is 2017 as well. And also that color blue now becomes these larger 10 foot bones that are on the current project. And the resin work. So this is the first sort of larger sculpture of a labyrinth. So this is the work that I made using bubble wrap and resin. And it carried the, you know, the weight of my father's body at the time of his passing. So it's, it's what the water was allowed to do to, to evaporate. And then it was filled back up. So in this particular project at LMCC, it's the same kind of format, except the water circulates. And the first color, first time using the color blue, this work here, and this sculpture here was a serpent head that they were mentioned, and this is a work that, um, it's a format for looking at fountains, that circular form that you see within, you know, Memorial spaces, public parks. You know, this work coming from, I believe that shot is in Oslo, on um, um exhibition, permanent exhibition that's there. I made this mock up for the shed. And yeah, I think I might stop here. I don't want to bore anybody, but these are you know, sort of how the sculptures are made, you know, starting with the clay version, which eventually becomes another, another iteration made in you know, through a mold to, to cast something in resin or something or another material. So that's kind of it. And these are the colors of the Paul Craft colors. The first time I used it, you know, with the pink color being the orange grove, we have a lavender cleaner, we have a pine cleaner all the way to the left, you know, finding ways to embolden work with 
of raw material history other than the making of itself. You know, here seen through, you know, products, you know, created by people that are incarcerated. And a few other things that are here. So I would like to hand this screen back over to someone else. I don't feel responsible enough to have this much power in my hands. So maybe someone can take over now. Um, that's great. It's amazing. Thank you. There's so many layers and uh, so many con connections and threads and it's kind of reflecting back and forth. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that you, um, your, your practice is very, you know, research driven, you're interested in histories and things like that. Um, can you maybe share a little bit more about like the archive as kind of the, the framework um, for all the things that you're thinking about and kind of, um, you know, trying to work through? Um, yes, uh, I began thinking about the archives, you know, definitely as a, as a Cooper student. One thing, just, I mean, shout out to Cooper, you know, Cooper Union is, um, it's a great space, you know, it allowed me to just do research, you know, it was never about being a sculptor or a photographer, just, just make work and be able to talk about the work, critique the work, be able to take criticism. I think that's a huge part of it, but better yet, defend your position. My position as a maker was that I wanted to make everything. I wanted to do whatever was necessary in order to get the idea across. So the archive was a way of doing that. And at the time, the only other thing I could attach it to or find a way to you know, sort of explain or write about it was the Library of Babel. You know, this text that was created by Borges, you know, where he talks about this large expanse of knowledge and, and an architecture that was not really big enough to contain all of the knowledge, right? So my archive was to be called the Fred Museum Archive. It was shifting, it was non-linear, thinking about like string theory, history is happening all at once, being able to get an object but having to reattribute the object, even the painting that's in the, in the exhibition. You know, so it was created for, for a cathedral in Rome in the 1600s, but the cathedral was to be demolished in the space for a prison, for Rome's first prison. So, as it, so the painting entered private collection until you know we were able to get it for the project. But if you look on the frame of the painting, it's attributed to a different maker than than the person that that we have now, right? But I allowed for that attribution to remain on the framing of the artwork, so that could have been taken out. But it's very important to leave that on. Like to say, history is limbo. History is something that's very that's usually manipulated with the mythology that's there. The same. I mean, think about the war on drugs, right? The, the idea about marijuana being one of the main things that the Reagans was up against. They're like, oh, we have to stop people from smoking marijuana, right? You know. But you know, the next couple, the last few months, we saw that legalized. You know, so all of this is just very malleable. You know. The law in itself is this sort of adapting performance piece, you know, this, this, this making process. But uh, I'm not sure if I'm getting away from the question. You know, I forgot the question. Even. It's down to no, I, no, no, no. I think um, that's actually really helpful for the question, sort of like you're thinking about the framework of an archive. And, you know, yeah. you've mentioned that their history is nimble, those kinds of things. I, you know, I think you'd probably agree that there are multiple histories as well. You know, mm -hmm. like, um, your work in it, you know, you think about like mythologies and stories and things like that. Um, and so I, I kind of wonder, you know, when you're sort of researching and looking at these different angles or these different views or different stories, you know, how do you sort of reconcile them into your own? And I think the archive kind of works in a similar way, you know, none of these things are subjective. So how do you kind of hold all of that and reconcile it together as you're, you know, working through all these different yeah, uh, keep, yeah, keep in record, you know, there's a, there's a master text where all of this comes from, you know, it's like a notebook that I keep, you know, relating to every single part of the archive, relating to a glossary system, you know, how things shift, you know, so almost like a mathematical, you know, way of like looking at things. So I keep a record of it. I think about things that are related to current affairs, you know, so there's certain works that I would make and only show it once. Most of it will never be shown again. You know, I make it, I show it. You know, I don't sell the work. I've been on the moratorium for about a, for a decade now. So it just goes into storage. I don't want the work to circulate. 
and certain things I would remake, like in this case, the Hermes suit, you know, the messenger guy, right, without making a color, you know, and I'll show some viscera, you know, just cutting all the severing, you know, and I'll place the head underneath, underneath that, a certain kind of violent act that relates to, you know, the killing, you know, certain people. But is it a way of keep, keeping records, a way of like creating a, a certain amount of confusion, you know, allowing the audience to walk into a space and having, having to be forced to deal with certain level of content. You know, it's not about curation in the sense that we put one object in the room and surround it with so much space. You know, they just kind of, you know, kind of, you know, Greenbergian white box, you know, system. It's about, you know, comparisons. You know, it's about walking through a city block and having to deal with so much at the same time. It's about the internet and multiple tabs being open. But the way that I select the objects to show at any given particular time is usually based on current affairs, you know, where I think things are shifting. And there were certain works I wouldn't have shown, you know, even two or three years ago that I would definitely make and show now. You know, like again, the color of the feet of Hermes, the multiple wings, the viscera. Um, even like that work, the American History X work with the curb stomp, you know, someone being murdered on screen. And what's, what's curious about that is that when people that are of age that saw the film, you know, back in 98 and they walk in and they're watching it, some of them are pissed off. They're like, where's the man that got his head crushed on the sidewalk, right? So there's a certain level of empathy that we may or may not have, you know, based on you know, experience, right? I'm looking at it, I'm like, well, that was a person of color, you know, so I relate to it very differently than certain people that might want to see that happen. So I had to admit that part and let people deal with, you know, other bodies, you know, and other sort of like mythological systems. But so, yes, it's a lot of editing. You know, it's a lot of editing. But I look at a lot of images, you know, to make the head of Hercules. I had to, you know, I have a file of just like seven heads, you know, because I wanted the emotionality. I wanted Hercules to feel dead, you know, to do this, you know, what does it feel inside of, you know, the cheekbone? You know, how does the jaw relax? How does the eyes, you know, what happened to him? How, how was he murdered? So to, to come up, to, to find that, that sort of imagery, we're just making a file of just scroll through the internet, you know, hundreds of just like seven heads, you know, just, just kind of get into that content. And funny enough, most of the images were coming from the Middle East, right? So you can also imagine depending on what side of the, Defense your arm, creation. What it is there is no real Middle East. Anyone that's from those regions say, "What the hell is that?" Really, right? It's an invention for the most part. So we get into that. That's a whole other conversation for itself. But how do we create some some groups, some you know terrorist groups? You know how you know, what's the format for for making that? Is a template for everything. So what is that mythology, and how do you talk about it within art history? And that's a big part. So, but it's all embedded in the head of her. You know, that we were looking at death and you know, martyrdom. But um, yeah, research edits, a ton of edits, you know, being incorrect sometimes and having to make another work just to correct something that I was off at. And looking at it from a janitor's perspective, you know, I call my, my process a janitorial process, you know, looking at it from the bottom up, but being able to do good housekeeping, right? And being able to make sure people can walk through the space and deal with the content. You know, I feel like people that are made to be sensitive, you know, usually not those in power, are able to make it work in a certain way, in a certain level of, 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 of intention, I believe. And, you know, there's no perfection, right? And I think that we feel that, we know that, and we kind of offer a space for the audience to join in the conversation. Thank you. Um, there's just, so much your practice is so rich it's kind of amazing um and i think maybe for uh, before we sort of shift into the q a people might have um can you look ahead for us a little bit um you know you've mentioned different things that come up in your work um you know thinking about colonization decolonialization um incarceration uh epidemic in the u.s those sorts of things and i think you know in our current moment some of those things are kind of popping up again in current affairs. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, what are you thinking about? Um, what are you working on? If you could share a little bit of that with us before we shift to Q&A, it'd be great. Yeah, that's a good question. 
what I'm working on now is really trying to find ways to affect systems in a, in a more lasting way. And it's kind of been a long, long term project. And I started joining boards like maybe about 10 years ago. And I started working with grassroots, you know, you know educational groups like 15 years ago, right? Making sure that the educational practice that goes along the making. And yeah, but as far as like the particular ways that I work, I'm looking at the digital space more often. I'm looking at technology, you know, ways to create things that that's like shifting. You know, there's a system, there's a piece of technology called Cerebro that I've been working on for a while that just kind of gathers information and stores information that the internet wants to delete. So I think it's a humongous amount of surveillance. And in this particular work we have here is this sense of spiritualism or religion, which is very different from spiritualism. The idea of the, um, the ominous Christ, right? The big brother is very much tied to Christian iconography and thought. So how do you make a work about that that's able to be malleable and to catch everything that, you know, that God wants to get rid of, right? So I'm thinking about that scale and the way of making. Although my work is very physical at the moment, you know, there has been this design that I've been working on for about a year, year and a half now. You know, so I think you know, digital space, you know, it's a big part of it. Creating worth within these communities. So for this particular project, what one thing I'm super happy about, you know, I mean, making objects is one thing, but the people you make it work is even better. So for this project, we work with Foster Pride. You know, so it's a group that has been for 25, I think 28 years now, working with young people in the foster care system, giving them like the arts, you know, programming and background from after school programs and scholarships. And we also work with Young New Yorkers, which is a jail diversion program. You know, so the way we work with them was engaging these two organizations, creating a connection between them and also allowing them to partake in the making process, you know, having the young people come in to learn how to make a sculpture, you know, to assist in mold making, to assist in casting, studio management. So creating a whole entire new workforce that are folks from a very different background from the workforce we see in the art world or in the archival community or the museum community, right? So that's, and that, you know, we did it, you know, within a few months, right? This is not, this is not a big organization and my studio is not a massive studio, right? There's no, there are no works for sale. You know, it's just the studio where we think about resource and not really commerce as much. Nothing is wrong with commerce, but if you can look at resource and abundance aspect, you can get things done. So being able to teach young people how to make things and how to manage a studio, handle a budget, you know, deal with things going wrong, right? Because that's ultimately what happens. So again, so just to you know scroll back a bit, you know, the future for me is you know digital, you know, but still physical as I love to make objects. You know, from creating equity, you know, certain idea of exchange and commerce, you know, idea of like um, mutual aid. And I don't know, but they, and also just staying, staying alive. That's a big part of it. Because this country and just the world in itself is a very challenging space for anyone that thinks, you know, differently. You know, and just keep challenging structures that I don't feel are conducive to happiness. Definitely, um, an act of resistance is still being here for sure. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, such a rich conversation. I know I keep saying this, um, but there's so much in your work and I really appreciate you um, unpacking it a little bit for us, um, giving us insight into your um, work and process and sort of, you know, what undergirds, how we are getting to see what we're getting able to see. Um, you know, again, as has been mentioned before and up in the chat, you know, hopefully um, we have until October to be able to take a field trip out to the Art Center at Governor's Island to see this incredible work in person. And so um, I think maybe now, if anyone has any questions, um, if you want to drop something in the chat for us or um, take yourself off mute and ask a question, that would be great. Oh, I see we have a hand raised here. Uh, yes, no, thank you, Leanne. Um, let's definitely shift over to the Q&A now. Um, I want to uh, agree and just add on that I, it, it is an amazing how rich and layered the, the work is and, and Onyetika's process. So um, thank you so much. 
um, to each of you, to Onyetika, Gabriel, and Leanne for this wonderful conversation. Um, yeah, let's let's jump right into the Q and A. Um, Josh, I'm gonna hand you the mic, so you should be able to um, activate your mic now. Onyetika, what's up? Can you hear me? I can hear you. How are you? I'm all right, man. Thank you, man, for for showing such uh, awesome work. Um, could you elaborate more on the Hercule head and, you know, because I just, I, I, because a, a little background, I got a little bit of understanding and, you know, this stuff and, you know, especially when you bring it to the forefront along with Mussolini, where Mussolini, uh, you know, affiliation in World War II. So it's a, it's a huge spectacle you running across with here with a real big powerful thing. So I was, I was, I was wondering like the Hercule head thing attract me because I never hear this story. Will you be able to share this myth with me? Um, yeah, part, partly, probably not all of it. Um, what, what you can on Yetika. Where do we start? Please. Where do we start? So Hercule as a demigod, you know, went through trials, you know, kind of this like proof of like might, you know, and how common can, how can, they, can somebody be and just the challenges from like Zeus, you know, and Hera. And somewhere within that, you know, at least for like my my iteration of it, you know, was was making it to make an edit. My iteration of it was to create something that's never happened before in that mythology and in art history. You know, was to also talk about, you know, because I, I remember protesting in 2020 and being on the streets and just thinking about what. You know, what figure would be able to carry a, a double meaning, right? Because Hercules was able to meet all of the challenges. You know, he slew the lion, a water lion on his head, right? He was able to just sort of do things that nobody was able to do. Like he was part God, part man. And, but he was like male, he was like a white male. He was a figure that supposedly we're all supposed to aspire to be like, but people were on the streets, right? So I'm like, well, you can do an edit. And, and also think about the people that use that same slipperiness of it, that slippage, you know, between good and bad to then enhance their own powers. So I'm not, I don't want to get too much into the mythology of Hercules as the way it's written, but I'm more interested in, in the edit, you know, and what could be done and what, what kind of mythology will come after the edit, right? Because that's, it's, a, it's a new version, it's an abridged version. You know, and I remember being in public school and just seeing just like how many additions to like one textbook would come out, you know, sometimes within like one year, right? And then having to always read it and always have to say now this is a new truth. You know, so for me, it's about this is the new truth now. You know, we are in a particular, you know, epoch, you know, of the making of like psychology. You know, we have, you know, as educators, you know, we can, we're making edits, you know, which is shifting things. But I guess I don't want to answer the question, or maybe I answer the question, you know, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a you know, specialist, you know, but I am someone that at least wants to practice, you know, actions of subversion and destructive, um, I don't know, like actions. So don't Thank be mad at me. I hope you're not mad. Oh, he Hold left. On. No, uh, you're still no, here. no, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm still here, Ross, but you know, I just, you know, I didn't want it to, I didn't want it to get it too into like the, the, you know, the question where it's hard to answer question and difficult to answer question. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to push your buttons just, just like that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So, you know, it, it was definitely a thought provoking question, but it, it would be definitely interesting, man. I go and Google you tonight, man. All right. All right. I'm not playing, man. I go and hit your <laughs> IG or something. Yeah, hit my IG. <laughs> Yo, respect. Respect, thank, brother. Thank you, Josh. And uh, thank you for that response, Anyetika. Um, And hey, everyone, reminder follow Anyetika on Instagram. <laughs> Uh, so next, I'm going to pass the mic over to Althea. Um, apologies if I mispronounced your name, but um, I'm going to, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Okay. Hi. Yeah, it's Althea. 
Um, I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more your relationship to using the Quaker pews and like how they played into the story that you were telling with the whole show. Cause I feel like you didn't touch on the choice of using the Quaker mm. pews specifically. Um, and I would just love to know what you were thinking with that a bit more. Yeah, let me actually do a quick screen share. Just, uh, just so everyone know what you're referring to. I think some people saw the show. I might've seen images and I have not. So here, is the blueprint for the space, you know, of the floor plan. So mm -hmm. the format that you see here was, um, you know, I first came up with this for like a large work I made in France in 2014, when they began the drone strikes, you know, so I was very much interested in how, you know, something that was Italian. So this particular, the first format that you see here, which is like maybe number one of my labyrinth system, came from a 17th century, you know, maze. That was meant to keep the peasantry away from palace wall. It was a way to create confusion. It was also decorative, right? It's supposed to be pleasing to the eye, yeah. but also disrupt, you know, movement. But I started to adapt it when I was thinking about a drone, the sight of the drone, right? Or thinking about, you know, animals that used to test, you know, how brilliant can someone be to navigate this structure, which is very much so like, is, is, you know, judiciary. You know, there's so many things involved in it. So, but in this particular, in, the, in this case, you know, I decided to use the pews as a way to just talk directly, you know, to the religious structure that created the, the, at least a certain taste or a certain idea of the carceral, the penitentiary system of the United States, which was Quaker, you know, the first um, penitentiary being made in Pennsylvania, you know, by the Quakers. But, you know, depending on who you're talking to, some people would say that what we have now is a perversion, you know, of their initial ideas, which, which was to have people be in silence, to be in meditation, you know, to contemplate their wrongs in society, and then to give penance, to repent, the mm -hmm. penitentiary. Um, some folks say, well, they didn't mean it. They didn't mean it to be so crazy with the, um, with the box, right? Where, so the box is a, is a place where people place the, or put 23 hours you know solitary confinement right you know so yeah but depending on who it is and, and that's what i think about things that are colonial is that you may think about it to be good right but once you put other people's histories and other people's bodies inside these spaces that you might have meant for yourself and for your own folks it might not work out the same way but even to those individuals that have that critique of it or that perspective i think it was always meant to be oppressive you know so in this particular exhibition we took this was my this is my original sketch you know i just took the cues and just we start to cut it up you know to make all these different ways to confuse the audience you know so when you walk into the into the project the first thing you see is all the way you know all the way from where you're standing is a renaissance painting on the side which is already kind of like what is this doing here right. it's a little bit off kilter then you try to enter the space and then you have to navigate this system, you know, in order to get to the painting, right? Knowing that the highest standard of beauty, at least the way that we've seen it for the last 500 years, has been this sort of painting, mm -hmm. you know? So to get to it, you have to navigate the system that was being created by someone that might not be within that history, you know, like myself, me. Um, so yeah, so I wanted like a real object that relates to that particular part of the archive. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted something that would challenge people, but then they could also be comforted. Maybe you want to sit down on it. Maybe you wanted to, you know, or just to climb over. You know, so I've had some people that's like, oh, fuck this. I'm not walking through this labyrinth. I'm just gonna climb over it. And I'm like, hell yeah, you know, that's a part of it. So uh, yeah, so that's kind of like why it's here and how it functions. Mm -hmm. And, and another interesting fact is, that, you know, I got the pews before the project was really solidified. You know, so the pews that I was able to get them was like 17 pews, and each of them are 14 feet in length, you know, like in January. And we didn't get final approval for the project till late February. Yeah. So, but something was just like, oh, this pro it has to be this, right? The labyrinth has to be something that people can sit in and just not believe in the measuring system of the torso which is where all the organs are. This is the most, between your head and here, everything is like set. So I wanted your body to be physically locked into space. 
you know, while you're contemplating. And also having the cues that face away from each other, right? Forcing folks to look at each other at the back of someone's head or to look directly at one another when mm -hmm. that might not be what you're into that day, right? But that's what the, a governmental structure would create. You know, so it's a forced movement. You know, it's very much very, um, it's, it's what is a city format, you know, produced here in the design of new cities, you know, Robert Moses, you know, that kind of structure of moving people to a shift into a space, the aqueduct mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of stuff. Thank you. Yeah. yeah Thank I, you. I'm on. sorry, go ahead. I think there's something else to say. Oh, no, no, they, I, I was interested in them because I, I have been doing some research into like the Quakers and their involvement in the creation of the public school system as well within the United States. So I was, that's an interesting piece that I didn't know about. So thank you. Yeah, and you know, that's a funny thing about, you know, the cost system. A lot of the vendors that produce, you know, tables, chairs, and even food, you know, mainly food for public school are also the ones that service you know, the carceral system. And when I was living in the Bronx, you know, there was a protest that was happening a few, this was a while ago, where I saw, you know, young people, you know, like in grade three, right? And they were protesting. I just stopped and I asked the teachers, I'm like, what are these young, what are these babies doing out here? They said to me, well, we're here protesting because the government is now using third grade testing scores to determine how many beds to create in, in state prisons. You know, so there is that there is that connection. There is a direct pipeline between public school and the Costco project. Right. You know, and then, and then in the death of like George Floyd, you know, Breonna Taylor, and a few other people, the connection there is that like the police are just a very small part of the bigger Costco system, right? They are just the chauffeurs that get you there, but right. the taxpayer dollars does create this other balloon, this crazy amount of wealth. We're talking about like sixty billion dollars. For like one industry so policing is a very small part of that so that so your research is super important in that it connects it's at the starting point mm -hmm. you know of uh, what well, the starting point is it, it will be the parents you know they tell what came for the chicken or the egg right, right. <laughs> so right. You have, like yeah so you know also how much funding does that neighborhood have for like decent school and decent food you know but that's another conversation so one of the programs that i've been trying to work on for this project, hopefully between now and, and when, the, when, the show, when the show closes, is a conversation surrounding this sort of structure and also a meditation session that activates the pews, where the audience will be, you know, will be welcome to sit, you know, and contemplate and also to read, to read a, you know, to read a performance which relates between water legislation and legislation that governs incarcerated, you know, population. Right, but feeling it through your own body because we are all performing this thing, but now we are policemen with the taxpayers. You know, much of the cost of the system is supported by tax dollars. Around 7% is actually private prison. The rest is just us. Mm -hmm. you know, so we are all part of this system in this way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Althea, and thank you, Anyaka, for that. Uh, wonderful and detailed response. Um, uh, next, I'm going to pass the mic over to our friend GE. GE, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Thank you, and thank you so much in so many different ways. I, I can't help thinking, watching all this, knowing the history of the particulars and the connections, uh, I was seeing so many other, like even larger associations here. The head on the floor, obviously it's Hercules, but I was also thinking instantly of Judith and Holferens and, and the liberation that many of us were making with the art of that mythology during the Trump times. Enough said. Also, thinking of the reflecting pool and Nike's feet being chopped off in such a, you know, in such a horrendous amputated way. And of course, surrounded, yeah, surrounded by the large femur bones interlocking, interlocking, which I think is incredible, was thinking so much more of like kind of charnel houses and, 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 and things of that nature. And I guess my, so my question is, how comfortable are you with, um, with open-ended interpretations of your work? Um, very comfortable. They're very comfortable. 
because in many ways it's like it's not my history you know it's, it's mine but it's ours yeah. right the same way i mean once you think about the way sites are excavated you know who gains the right to excavate a site and when i spent when i spent time in libya you know most of the sites were not excavated by libyans or africans mm. you know it was italians you know most of the museums were excavated by Mussolini and he wanted to do it, right? Because it felt or add to his might, right? To be the one to, dis to discover the Romans in, in an African land, right? So it depends on who has, who feels the right to look at museums and the objects they have, you know, who, who's allowed to take objects from, you know, middle America and place it in a museum. You know, so it's very much anyone's call. You know, I believe that once you have a body, then you have a right to history, you know, to archive. You know, so my interpretations, like all my interpretations, are uh, borrowed from everybody else's in this bank and everyone else's, uh, you know, ancestral past. Yes, I love it because I think your art so transcendent that way, and it speaks obviously to our particulars right now. What we need to be working with and what we need to be activated by, but also, two hundred years from now, this is still going to speak to people. So thank you so much for. You're welcome, and then thanks for adding to the research. You know, so one thing that I do often here at LMCC is that I just show up and I talk to people. You know, I like to just be as much here as I can. I'm becoming a bit more busy as I work on other things, but you know, I've learned so much just by engagement. So thanks for that. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you to the rail and Nick and everybody for making this possible. Thank you, GE and. Thank you, Anirika. Um, next, I am going to pass the mic over to my colleague, Anya. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for this talk and for elaborating on your work. Um, I just wanted to ask you to uh, expand um, on uh, your response to Leanne's question of what's next for you. And I'm curious, you know, what topics you hope to tackle in the future for this ongoing archival work, um, perhaps like, um, yes, yeah, mm -hmm. topics that you are, are dreaming of that that seem far in the future, but um, perhaps are envisioning. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, one is this this project. I think I mean Gabriel. There there were other components that were not here. You know, there were like archival things that came from, you know, on the state court system. And also things that came from the carceral system. There were, you know, research and, and you know the technology, you know, pieces, technological pieces that were not shown here. So one thing that that's more on the immediate side, right? To have a more expanded version of this project that also would shift, you know, based on the new space, you know. And each, I never showed the same thing twice per se. So that's one piece of it to kind of have, you know, like a larger swath of it be shown. Um, maybe like publish the glossary. This you know, it's been like 10 years now, you know, with so many floating components. And I think it's interesting to do it now because it seems that there's more sculpture being made. You know, I think when I started, you know, sculpture's always been around, but as far as like contemporary art and younger makers, you know, there was not a lot of introduction. But now that there's so much being made, I think it's always good to create some kind of like format for like being in the archives. I want to allow more access to it. And grand scheme, you know, I began a project on, you know, human organ trading, you know, when I did, when I entered the archives of Frederick Douglass, you know, working with his manuscripts that he wrote, you know, of course, himself in his own hand handwriting, connecting the slave trade to like current trends in human trafficking and organ trading. So that project I did at SCAD Museum in 2019, so that's on the website, and it's a part of it. I want to expand upon that, connecting more to the carceral system, you know, jump off of that and get into the bigger internet surveillance system because all of these things are interwoven. And even looking at protests, right, with looking at the, um, the 1950s and 60s protests and then seeing what happened after the 1968 period where SWAT teams started to become like a real, you know, issue, right? Because now people start to see, wow, folks can, can come out in hordes, big groups. And, I, and also to look, do a follow-up and an update to 2020 protests. You know, since then we've seen a lot of laws that are like anti-protest laws heavier than you had in 68 and 69. You know, but how do you talk about that? How do you bring in this, this perspective of art history? That's been my challenge that into art school. I'm like, well, okay, you're talking to me all these theories, you have this sort of like Joseph Boyzian theory of like social sculpture. 
you know, and you talk about Kant, you know, and a few other figures, but how does it really relate to like the particulars of daily life? How do we talk about these things? How do we, you know, pick it apart, right? You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out, figure out like new formats, you know, in many ways. So, um, so the answer is, yeah, first uh, expound upon this, get more detail in what's allowed for the audience to, to take in. Um, and also, yeah, collaboration, you know, which sort of, which group can I keep working with, you know, that are doing the work within their own communities, like how many young people can we employ, how many people can we, you know, build or allow to attain skill sets, you know, in the art world. You know, and how can we get into research and become part of a research academy, per se, for the archives? You know, I want to have something that's more ongoing. But uh, hopefully that's not too, too long of an answer. It's ambitious. You know, what, what, what's going to happen next? Probably something that takes a long time. Thank you. Very exciting. Thank you both so much. Um, and for our final question of the day, I uh, will pass the mic over to the Rails' own Fong H. Bui. Fong, over to you. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much. I was, was sorry that I was in and out some meeting, but I think I heard at least 40% of it. I will re-listen to the whole conversation later, which is something that's a pleasurable when I do have been on, on my own, which is super rare these days. Thank you, Lian, also for leading this conversation, Gabriel. And the artists, I uh, I can't wait to see the show. And, uh, you know, in hearing what you just say about, you know, I'm super aware of your archives for sure. And yesterday we actually spoke to a, a two leading member of the Interference Archives. So archives have been in my head all day long now anticipating for this one. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm, I, I agree with Gabriel, who I know forever, even before high school. Why get, why get, <laughs> I'm very happy that he become who he becomes. It's so nice and handsome. I just <laughs> felt the whole idea, the whole idea of, of, of archives, in the, the, what is the, the telepathy of the archives. You know, this is exactly what you're doing. Echo my uh, dear friend, the terrific poet, Susan Howe, who said, words are spirit, paper is skin, mm. and it is the body trace that ties the two together. In body trace is really how you read your three-dimensional pictorial form. You know, that's, it has the right patina, it has the right pictorial form and scale, and I think that's allowed you to do the complex form that is not easily bounded to one single uh, reading. And I'm very, very, um, you know, impressed by that broad and very elusive way of thinking about art anyway. Um, you know, I'm reminded, I only met him once, Michel Rotuil, you know, the great Haitian anthropologist, died too young. But um, I remember reading his famous book, it's called Silencing the Past, Power and Production of History. I don't know, it's written somewhere in maybe mid nineties, you know. Um, he, he says something so interesting in referring to silence, which is the, the, the power of the unspoken, you know, words that we, we are interested. And he say that there's a four process, four crucial moments the moment of fact creation, the making of the sources, bringing the source together, moment of fact assembly, which is making the archive essentially, right? And then the moment of fact retrieval, the, the, the making of the narratives. And then finally, the moment of retrospective significance, which is the, the history of final instances. So, and I, I wonder, you know, in terms of thinking in that sense, which allow you to go back to the past so fluidly. Um, you know, how would you go about editing? That's one thing that I'm also thinking about myself, you know, who have this archival mindedness, mindfulness, which I learned so much from many friends I made over the years, you know, the editing process is so intense. How would you describe that even on daily routine, you know? 
Yeah, um, thanks for the question and thanks for having me. Um, editing process, I've been asked that question for so long. Mm. You know, and I've always been told that it's just so much work at the same space. It's a lot of information. How do you deal with this? And sometimes, you know, I've done projects that kind of got into more of a dark, you know, just like dark net and just like stuff that people don't want to look at. So part of it is exhaustion. You know, how much can you handle before you're exhausted? You know, when it's like my own exhaustion, yeah. But when it's like yeah. for the audience, you know, how long can you watch a video? How long can you stand up? How long, how much space can they navigate before they give up? So there's something about, you know, struggle and duration. You know? mm. and, I, and that's something that relates to the body. I think about the body quite often. Even that work that I showed from Switzerland with that dome, you know, it carried the measurement of my own torso for each piece of the glass, right? And then if I was to stand with my hands ripped apart, it would measure one of those supposed windows, right? So the body and the format, you know, and also that skeletal thing being the system, the infrastructure, you know, if you think about the government, you know, what keeps it up is the police on the block, you mm. know, and it's sort of, um, it's, it, it, and it's also garbage removal, right? So it's very much body related. And in this project, there's so many different scale shifts. You know, I've had really young ones. I love when the, you know, when, when the fourth grader comes in here or the three-year-old, they're like, oh my God, dinosaur bones, right? Yeah. But I'm saying, no, that's the human body scale to me, the scale of an architecture. We measure everything, even mountains. We measure that on scale in feet or meters. You know, so um, yeah. So I think you know to edit is exhaustion. You know, how much we put in this exhibition is based on you know how much work I can do. You know, how much you know I can call upon other people to help do. You know, until I'm exhausted, they're exhausted. You know, and you know, so that duration is usually based on the body, right? And some days I might be able to work twenty-hour days, which you know. Gabriel, <laughs> we kind of had some wild days, right? You know, I could push and some days I, I just can't. And there's a cutoff, you know, after that three month mark, I'm like, all right, we need to cease, you know, until the next time, next iteration of it. And, and again, based on current affairs, you know, so now I'm going to actually highlight parts of the archive that did deal with the Afghan crises, because now we're seeing it come to a supposed halt, at least on the official American, you know, like <laughs> feed system is saying there's a halt, but that, I'm sure that's not what's going on. Uh, yes, yes, yeah, so it's a few ways, you know, current affairs, exhaustion of my own body, space, and resources, and hopefully, you know, institutions. And I just want to also just um, highlight something is this is a work that's hard to curate. You know, that's the other thing too, just given the scale of it and how many pieces waste things enter and exit. What's happened up to the last minute, you know, and I'm happy to work with a curator that's not thinking in the most institutional sense. You know, it's not um, someone that might have, you know, I don't think it could have been done with a different curator, at least at this, at this particular moment. You know, have to be someone that's sort of from the outside, you know, because the work kind of deals with information that's not as mainstream and wants to be presented in a way that's not mainstream. So there's a lot of loss of space and time, you know, and confusion. You know, but are we all confused anyway? Isn't the system meant to confuse us? You know, that's, I want to leave that on the table. Terrific. Well, wait, wait, hold on one second. Are you going to make a drawing of me? Maybe. I will. <laughs> <laughs> I want a drawing. No. <laughs> no, I think that's one of the, the um, you know, the task right now is. <laughs> To create my own archive, you you absolutely yeah. right about this. The portrait is becoming more an archive than I ever anticipated. Right. So the invention of Zoom, which is imminently democratic, there's right. a bit here. There's people can ask their own question and whatnot. And ultimately, it really comes from my own uh, portrait installation. Let me give you a glimpse. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Whoa. So this is one piece, 40 on top, faces on the bottom, same thing, interrupted with a group of 20 meditation, meditation painting, which is oh, wow. all about recapture my own roots, growing mm. up in Vietnam, going to temple and meditating. 
Nice. So now I have about 38 of those walls. And I know uh, everybody wants to be drawn now. <laughs> I, Fung, Fung, I don't, I don't want to be drawn, but I want to show. Can I show the portraits of Pioneers? <laughs> Sure. Let's let's do the show, baby. Let's, let's do it. Talk. Let's talk, you guys. I love the conversation. <laughs> exactly what the rail is about, you guys. It's about that in the you know imminent democratic that mm -hmm. Whitman talk about the multitude under my feet. Yes, the definitely. Constellation up above. So thank you. It make me super happy and nurture and energized mm -hmm. by everything. Can't wait till the poetry reading. That will yes. be the completion of the whole beautiful day spent. <laughs> so thank you, you guys. Back to you, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you, Fong, and um, thank you again, Onyerika, for that response. Um, I, I want to remind everyone, yes, that the exhibition is open through October 31st. Uh, the link is in the chat, so I encourage everyone that's able to, to go and visit that. Uh, congratulations to you both, and and thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Anya Decker, for joining us today, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. Um, before we go to the poetry reading, I just want to quickly uh, shout out a comment in the chat from Ty Allen that said, uh, "Chuke, I've watched you push boundaries, but you have always been about mastery of space and spirit." So, thank you for that, Ty. And we will. Um, we'll unmute everyone at the end after the poetry reading, so please feel free to add on to that. But uh, as Fong said, we do have a tradition here at uh, uh, in our NSC of closing all of our events with a poetry reading. I'm very thrilled to welcome our friend, I.S. Jones, to the stage. Um, queer American Nigerian poet and music journalist, I.S. Jones, is a graduate fellow with The Watering Hole and holds fellowships from Kalalu. B-O-A-A-T, Writers Retreat, and Brooklyn Poets. IS hosts a month-long workshop every April called The Singing Bullet. Her chapbook, Spells of My Name, is forthcoming with Newfound in 2021. Um, without further ado, everyone, IS Jones. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you so much, everyone, for having me here. I'm just going to read two poems and then uh, close this out for the day. And both of these poems are from my forthcoming chapbook, Spells of My Name. Can you speak Yoruba? I asked my father for the word thief in Yoruba. He says ole, says it also means lazy. Ask him for rain, he says ojo, that it's the same word for coward. It's been said you begin to master a language when you dream in it. I ask my father if his mother visits his sleep, searching the dark with his face for her hands. Faithful as nightfall, my father doesn't answer, calls me buruku, a word he won't translate, but I know is a rebuke by the way it undoes my name. So I slip the word heavy as a shot shell into my mouth. There are other ways to spell silence. A faceless hunter moves towards a black fawn. Snow renames the landscape, but there isn't a word for snow in Yoruba. Language retreats where it isn't felt. A buckshot rings its bells to the sky. A herd of deer scatter the day's remains and are chased by their panic into the night. I ask my father how to say yes in Yoruba. He says, Benny but that it translates into it is so. The hunter moves as the fawn moves through the enclosure of trees, taking aim between the eyes, my bleeding skull knighted to the floor. Forgive the tongue that flexes towards what it knows best. Ojo, ojo. I kept saying coward when I meant to say rain. And this is my last poem, Esperanza. Looking back now, I must have misremembered Esperanza to mean wild horsewoman, the word deriving from the Latin sperer, meaning hope. Either way, I could see it. A thousand grandmothers galloping into dusk, night being the dark horses carrying off the day on their hooves. My grandmother lifts her head and wind bows, shifts her legs in a man's knees buckle, could turn a lover to a drought with a single glance. Now she returns to me as myth on four legs scattering the wet earth behind her. My grandmother calling my name, which was once hers, 
how she and my father's mother crowned me in this name having never met. Two equine women running as I have learned to run. The story goes her presence would remind men of their mortality until my grandfather sought to subdue what others could not. I wish I thought to ask, give me a truth I need to survive. She would tell me don't worship men. What a waste of devotion. It's been said women have nothing of our own, not even what we're named. Call it a moonless clarity. How she passes through me every time the dark unknuckles and the night loosens its blue black skin for stars. Thank you. Thank you so much, IS. Um, snaps and claps around the virtual room. Uh, it's always such a joy to welcome you to this space. So thank you. And um, as Malvika did share in the chat, uh, we were uh, blessed to have IS curate our 45th Radical Poetry Reading. So check that out. Um, I, I wanna thank you all again for joining us. Thank you, Anitaka. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, we uh, do this every day at 1 p.m. Uh, but we will be taking a break from the live event on Monday. So please join us for a virtual screening of Forest Best, Key to the Riddle, courtesy of Chuck Smith and Ari Markopoulos. Uh, if you RSVP on our event site, you will receive a uh, video link and password that you can view the film throughout the day on Monday. Um, I wanna wish everyone a safe and relaxing holiday weekend. And uh, you can all now turn on your mics to say, Hello and goodbye, and uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Oh, you did, guy. What's up, baby? Hey. <laughs> oh, my God. It's been a while, brother. It's been a it's while, man. It's been a while. I'll be back home it's in a couple of days. I enjoyed it. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank Ooh, you. What a lovely. Thank you, Thank Thank you everybody. everyone. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Tiola. You tell a good job. Thank you. Everything was wonderful. <laughs> Beautiful conversational. This is Thank you all. Great job, brother. Thank you for the reading. Hello. Thank you, Gabe. Thank, Thank you, Paul.